Welcome to our first episode from our first series on evolution. And this series is going to focus on how Charles Darwin came up with this theory of evolution, what influenced him to come to this theory, and what were some of the evidence to back him up. And then we'll have a second series on evolution where we deal with the genetics behind how evolution happens. So let's learn about Charles Darwin. Well, before we get into that, let's look at our definition of evolution. Evolution is simply known as a change over time. And this happens through a process of natural selection. And we're going to learn about this in more detail in an upcoming um, a screencast. Now, when we talk about the theory of evolution, I want to focus on this word theory. The word theory is a very, very powerful word in the world of science. And the simplest explanation that I can give you is that a theory is a hypothesis with a lot of scientific evidence, a ton of ton of evidence, all right? And so when we hear the word theory, that means something to a scientist. That means we've got a ton of data and evidence to back this up. Now, out in the non-scientific world, people who do not accept the theory of evolution, they'll typically say, how can you believe in evolution? It's just a theory. Well, those individuals don't understand how powerful the world theory is. That means that we have a ton of evidence to back this up. And we have so much evidence on evolution that it's looked at almost as a fact. Now, I say almost because if we come up with new evidence, we will change or alter the theory. And that is the beauty of science. So let's learn about Chuck. All right. Charles Darwin was a British gentleman who was born in the early 1800s. In fact, he was born on the very exact same day as President Abraham Lincoln. Now, Charles was born to a reasonably wealthy family. His grandfather was a physician. His dad was a physician and actually a pretty good investor. So he really comes from kind of an upper class, but not quite royalty part of England. Now, his dad was very, very overbearing. He ruled the family with an iron fist. And Charles was always looking for dad's approval, which was often very hard to come by. Now, Charles was originally went to college to become a doctor, just like the other men in his family. But you're talking around the 1820s era. This was before we had anesthesia. And when you're learning how to be a doctor, you'd be in this big auditorium with uh, down on the stage, in a center stage, would be an operating table. Well, they couldn't knock these patients out. So there'd be a lot of screaming, a lot of blood. And Charles is very sensitive. He's like, I want nothing to do with being a doctor. Now, Mr. Overbearing Dad was like, well, Charles, if you are not going to be a doctor, then you are going to become a minister. You're going to run a church because that's the only acceptable job for a Darwin to do. If you're not going to be a doctor, you need to be a preacher. All right. But what Charles really wanted to do is that he wanted to become a naturalist. This would be a person who would go out into the field, be it the woods, jungle, an ocean, a pond, or whatever, and he wants to study how nature does what nature does. Well, as you can see, in England in the early 1800s, that's not going to really pay the bills, and that's not an acceptable job for a person of Darwin's social class. So while he was doing his theology training, he still studied uh, natural history, or what we would call biology, on the side. And he was actually quite good at it. In fact, Charles Darwin is actually a fantastic scientist. Now, when Charles graduated, he had a choice. He could go be a pastor at a church, or he could do his first love, which was naturalism. Right? And one of his professors says, hey, Charles, there's this ship. It's going on an around-the-world trip, and they're looking for a naturalist to collect specimens and et cetera along. It's the perfect job for you. Would you like to go? Charles said yes. He eventually negotiated the blessing from his father, and off he went on his majesty's ship, 
the Beagle. And it was taking a five-year voyage around the world, and it was during that time Charles Darwin collected the specimens, he made observations, and he begins to develop his theory of evolution. But Dad was a little worried because these kind of trips around the world at this time were extremely, extremely dangerous. Probably a 50-50 chance that Charles would never come back. All right, so let's look at the map here of Charles' trip. He starts out with from Plymouth, England, and he's going to head towards uh, South America. And they make these little stops along the way. And every time Charles would, would stop at a port, he'd go out and he'd kind of look at the fauna and the uh, flora of the area and collect a lot of specimens. But I want you to pay attention to this area right here. It's these tiny islands that are practically right on top of the equator that had the greatest impact on Charles Darwin. We're going to talk about it just a little bit. These, um, these islands are quite unique. They're volcanic, but they're on a tectonic plate that's moving away from the hot spot. So one island is built and it's being pushed off the hot spot and it changes from volcanic to practically tropical and then they eventually become a, a, a desert. And so we see these various different habitats on these islands and that allows for a nice kind of incubator for uh, evolution. But as you can see here, he also visited Australia, some of these islands out in the Indian Ocean, and around Africa, and all the way back. It took him five years, and uh, you, can, you can just imagine the adventures that a young Charles would have had, a man in his 20s. All right, so what do we get from Charles's journey on the Beagle? Well, the first off thing that I want you to understand is that Charles Darwin is a fantastic scientist. He is really really good at his craft. He is innately curious. He is very good at collecting data. And data for him would be uh, specimens that you'd put in a jar uh, with the mineral spirits to keep them from decaying. He would also press flowers and plants. he smash them in a book so they're nice and flat and they will be preserved. And he also took copious amounts of notes. Filled journal after journal after journal. Exactly what a really good scientist would do even today. He also was very observant. He noticed that there were patterns of diversity. He noticed that any organism was remarkably adapted to their environment. In fact, they had the traits, whatever they would be, to survive perfectly in that environment. In fact, they were so good at their environment that they could outcompete other organisms for their particular spot. Now, he was also puzzled at how very similar ecosystems would have different organisms. So if there was a grassland in Australia and a grassland in Argentina, the thought of today is that you would see similar animals. So for example, if there were deer on the grassland in Argentina, there should be deer on the grassland in Australia. However, you might have the deer or the antelope in Argentina, but in Australia, you would have kangaroo. Why would you have remarkably different organism, but they're actually kind of doing the same role. They're the herbivores of that. And so Charles was quite curious. Why was that? Why did that happen? Okay. He also collected a number of fossils. Fossils are the once living, or actually, let me rephrase this. Fossils are the remains or traces of once living ancient creatures. Typically, they're fossilized bones, uh, you may find these as fossilized footprints. You know, they were planted in volcanic ash, and they've hardened in the rock, and now you've got a, a perfect footprint of that, okay? He noticed that certain fossils looked almost identical to modern organisms where other fossils did not. In other words, these organisms had gone extinct. Now, why did Charles, or let me rephrase this, Charles then wondered, why did this organism go extinct but this one has been allowed to survive until modern times. He was quite curious on how that could happen. Right. Now, the Galapagos Islands, as I said before, these guys were really, really important to Charles. Once again, they're located off the, uh, the western coast of South America. They're practically on the equator. Each island has different climates and different habitats. This means that they have different selection pressures. And he noticed that there were similar species on the different islands, but 
They all had special adaptations to survive in their particular environment. Now, based upon his observations on this trip, he began to develop what he called his theory of evolution by natural selection. And in a future uh, episode in this series, we're going to talk in more detail about what uh, uh, natural selection actually is. Okay? Now, we're going to stop right here on this episode. This is the first of a five-part series. So until the next episode, we're going to catch you on that flip side.